Hello, I have <clears throat> a new microphone and a new webcam, so we'll see if these are better. Hmm, distorting voice? Really? Let me see. Is it clipping, I guess? Let me, let me get my headphones out and I will continuously speak. This is a weird microphone. <clears throat> oh, that's super clipping. Turn the gain down. Turning the gain down does not necessarily seem like the right solution. Oh, maybe it is. I don't know. How is that? How is that, people? Let me see. Do I have it, like, cranked? OBS settings. I don't see, they keep moving things around. I don't see any kind of like microphone multiplier in here. It's way too quiet. Well, I don't know, guys. Okay. I've turned the gain up now. Let's see how that is. cardioid pattern. Or condenser pattern or whatever. I thought condenser mics were supposed to be good at filtering out background noise, but I feel like I totally hear way more street noise than I actually can hear in real life. You know, none of the patterns on the back look like cardioids, so maybe I bought the wrong mic. Who knows? I've bought like seven microphones and they're all bad for one reason or another. Okay, let me just try really fast. Um, changing this to the new webcam. I still hear street noise, but it's not worse. So which of those two mics do you guys prefer? The street noise really could be, because a lot of the surfaces in here are uh, highly re like reflective concrete, it could be the street noise is just like bouncing off the walls and coming into the microphone. So it, it might legit not be the microphone's fault. Okay, people are saying the first microphone is better. All right, so I'm gonna go snack up and then we'll start in a second.
Yeah, I think we need to like soundproof this room a little bit. We're gonna have some noise specialists come in here and take a look. Yeah, maybe I should put something under the microphone as well. I don't necessarily have a good insulating thing, but I'll put it on this notepad. It's better than nothing. Let me see what it sounds like when I type. Yeah, I can, I can hear the vibration, but that's just what we're going to put up with today. Okay. Oh, you know, before we start, I'm going to bind some hotkeys before we officially start. I'm going to bind like F1 and F2. So I never figure out. So keys and macro. For 19, it's going to be F1, and it's going to uh, show run tree show debug.exe, I think, and then F2 is going to run the compiler. that F2. All right, I never got around to fixing that. F2. Wait, what? I don't know what I did to my meta program to mess that up. Oh, it's probably that the, inclu the includes are different. Let's uh, 
Let's just try this. All right. Okay, thanks everybody for coming by. It's time to continue on and do some more slideshow functionality. Um, and since the last time, I thought of a lot of things that could be done. So what I'm going to do at the start here is just um, start typing out a to-do list of what are all the things we could do, and then I'm just going to start knocking things off the list. And it's going to be probably too many things uh, to do in one session, I think. All right, but let's go. We already had, how did I put it in source? Yeah, so I already had some things that we're gonna work around and actually I'm gonna add the one thing that keeps persisting, which is figure out what needs to change in the meta program and or the compiler to avoid this problem when I include things using uh, an absolute path. It might be that the compiler is just always assuming that you have a relative path and concatenating things. All right, so this is uh, like infrastructure stuff here. And we're not going to worry about that right now. We're going to worry about application stuff, but with application spelled correctly. So, um, let me really quickly review where we are at before I start typing out the to-do list. So for those of you who weren't here, I've got this slideshow. There's a text file that we'll look at in a second where you can say what the slides are and what the text is and what the background color is and all that stuff. And I can flip around with the arrow keys and what you see right now is basically the whole program so far uh, and now our job is to make it better. If I go uh, to here in this file my.show is a thing that defines that whole slideshow there we are. And so last time we created the file format, we added a few little commands to the file format and the capability, well, we added the capability to even have the idea of slides and process input and stuff. Okay, so now let me start listing out things that I can't do yet uh, that I would like to be able to do. Well, I'd like to be able to, whoops, I'd like to be able to change font. I'd like to be able to change the font size for any given text. Um, I'd like auto uh, layout as I type multiple lines. Simple auto layout. So to illustrate that, right, so remember I did this when I had a two line thing here. I said, oh, this one's at y.6 and this one's at y.4. If I take out that y.4 or comment it out like that, whoops, I ran the wrong program. I'm used to hitting my old hotkey to stop. All right, so, so now these two lines land on each other, right? Which is not very convenient, so I'd like to be able to list multiple lines and have it, you know, go down by some automatic uh, line, uh, you know, essentially do a carriage return as I do that, right? So I'm gonna be able to change fonts, change the font size, simple auto layout as I type. Um, uh, define and use styles for fonts. So I want to be able to set a font and a font size and all that, right? Um, I want, uh, well, let's say uh, the ability to create colored rectangles on the screen, right? Because I want to be able to make simple charts and stuff. And, you know, maybe you want other shapes than rectangles, but rectangles is a good start. But here's the thing, once you're starting to lay things out, like if I want to make three bars in the same position, like to make a, a graph, like say the bars are different heights, 
then defining the size of the graph and where it's laid out. Uh, to do that easily, I'm going to want to like declare and use variables, right? Because if I want to say, well, here's the y where the chart lives, and then I want to move the chart down because I'm adding more text above it or something, then I don't want to have to manually edit every one because that's kind of error prone, right? Um, so we want to be able to declare and use variables. Um, I want hot loading. We might do that first. Um, so I want to be able to change my file and see uh, the contents change as we go. Um, what else? I feel like there's many more things than this. And we may just keep adding to this list over. Can anyone think of things that are missing from this list that are not like advanced functionality? You know, there's spell checking, right? We could add spell checking. English only at first. I mean, you could talk about stuff like italicizing and bolding and, and things. I'm not going to worry about that yet. Um, it's not that important for what I want to do. And the main headache of that stuff is like organizing fonts, actually, rather than uh, doing something else. But there is, there is a capability, which is uh, ability to change uh, font color, et cetera, midline without a new line, right? Which you could sort of do in a very hairy way right now, but it's like you want to just be able to say, you know, if you want a bolded word in the middle of a sentence, the way that our data structures work right now, it's not totally natural. Oh, uh, we want uh, text justification, right? Left, middle, right. We don't have that. Oh, we want to load images. Uh, load images. And I don't know. Animation along elements. Well, so in general, if you mean transition animation, yeah, we can do transitions. I don't want to do goofy transitions, but some kinds of transitions can just help with mental coherency, like showing the old slide leaving and the new one being underneath or something is there's a way in which it makes less of a snap event and more of a continuum event i don't know some things like that word wrap um maybe the thing about that is um i'm not really a fan of all the auto formatting that PowerPoint does. Like, it almost never does what I actually want. Um, so I, I find that often I would rather manually wrap or change the font size or something. So uh, I'm going to put that down, word wrap down, as a question mark. Word art. Oh, right, so layout around images is an interesting one. So like Sean is mentioning, you know, sort of flowing the text around an image. The question I have for that is, maybe it's hard enough to do that, that it's better to wait till there's a graphical editor to do it, right? Like in a graphical editor, I can think like, let me set up this box and then that box, and the text flows from this box to that box. Um, doing it in a file, it just seems hard for me to visualize and type in the right thing, but maybe I'm not being imaginative enough about that. No lists or bullet points, no... Presenter, oh, presenter mode, yes. So, uh, presenter mode, uh, page up and page down, which would go to the beginning and the end of the slideshow. Um, that one's easy. We can sort of put, I'm gonna put that early because it's, it's not particularly hard. So 
Sorry if it sounds hollow. It's better than the mic I used yesterday. Yeah, when it comes to stuff like links to different slides, I think that's, uh, that's going to be a long-term thing because I want to do that a little differently than you might imagine. Oh, um, drawing on slides, uh, uh, toggling cursor visibility, uh, changing cursor visual attributes, right? So I might want to make the cursor big or small, depending on like what I'm trying to call attention to maybe, or just based on what the viewing conditions are. Someone says all they've ever wanted from PowerPoint was more control over animations, keyframing, etc. I never use animations in PowerPoint. I don't even know how to use animations in PowerPoint. It's just not the kind of thing that I do. Oh, all slides overview, right. So like um, some kind of like, uh, yeah, we'll call it overview page, overview mode, where you can see all the slides and then maybe click on them to go to the individual one. Yeah, calling game like code, uh, that's going to happen eventually, but I think that that sort of really advanced functionality probably comes after the basics. So I'm, I'm sort of just trying to list the basics right now. What if you use your game engine code base to bring in slide animations from Maya? Why would I do that? Text to speech input. No. Yeah. All right. So this is this is enough. If if we think of other things later on, we can hit them. But this is probably enough. So let's start with hot loading because that'll be that'll be a good thing to demo. Um, or it'll be a good thing to have while testing all these other features. So now. Um, I don't seem to emit the hot loader, which seems like a problem. So I'm going to go to Sokoban for a second and see what I do to, to emit the hot loader. So what happens is the hot loader knows how to interact with these catalogs. Um, so if it sees something that's a file extension that an asset catalog claims to handle, then it calls the code for that catalog. Otherwise, it'll call this thing called my hot loader callback. Um, now, in, yeah, if we were trying to factor this apart to not require the game engine at all, then maybe it should only call the callback and the callback should know about catalogs. Uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see how to factor that. But this is the way the abstraction works right now. And so, I'm going to start with the my hot loader callback, and I'm going to change stuff. So we log a message every time we get here, and. So we're not going to load variables or key map files yet, although we may do a key map file eventually. And I'm going to say, well, if the extension is uh, show. So incomplete only reload this if it is the actual slideshow we are currently editing or viewing. Right, so right now, any slideshow that changes on disk, we're going to load it and display it, which may not be what you want. Uh, I'm not going to worry about leaking the current slideshow because I don't care. This is only for during development anyway. Um, probably, I mean, we'll see. And then I think.
That might do it. That might be everything that we need to do to hot load. I did not successfully compile before. Oh, wait. Compile. Thank you. All right, so, right, so we have this. Let's see. I'm going to go to my.show, and I'm just, I'm just going to make a white space change and save that. Okay, it says non catalog asset change, and maybe it reloaded it. Uh, so let's, let's put this 0.4 back down here. So if it loads it correctly, then we should no longer have over, yes, we no longer have overlap text, right? So I can change the colors. Oh. How about, how about something more like cyan? Oh, that's yellow. Cyan is gonna be more like that. I know my colors. Anyway, so, this is not so bad all of a sudden, right? Like hot loading, as soon as you have it, um, goes a significant amount of the way to, to making up the gap that you have for not having a GUI. Let me change this, these colors. These are ugly. Um, background. Let's make it like a darker red. Right, I mean, what was the previous, right? Eh. No, I don't like purple. See, why am I picking all these ugly colors? This is when I need a color picker. All right, this is not too bad. It's not great. Text color is gonna be a whitish green. All right, that's good enough for now. It's less ugly, it's still not good. This is a pretty ugly combination, actually. I tried. All right, so, um, so I can even, let's test that I can add more slides. It should work. I could say, No, that wasn't it, right? And so now, there we go. So now I have more slides. So that's great. That's, that's good action, as they say in the business. Is the hot loader using Windows API to detect that the file has changed? Yes, it is. Is that the Windows 95 blue? I don't know. Do you need to check the current slide number after hot load to make sure it's in range? No, because I do that every frame, I believe. Let's double check that. But I did, I thought of that very explicitly, and in my mind I said no, because I do it every frame. Uh, yeah. So, well, when I say get current slide, I, I clamp the slide index to whatever the count is. So if I were to hot load, like, in the frame, after I've acquired this, that would be bad news. But, you know, hot loading happens. Uh, hot loading happens here, which is even after we swap buffers at the end of the frame. So that's pretty good. Uh, let's, so I'm hitting page up and page down now and nothing is happening. So let's make those work. And then we can check those off the list. Wait, I thought, oh no, it was called user input. All right, so recall we had this thing where we say arrow up, arrow down. Let me make sure that I defined page up and page down. Or no, these would just be an input. We don't have page up and page down. That's how little I use these keys. So this is the sort of the abstraction. So you could think of this as the SDL-like thing that we would supply in the standard library of like, if you just want to write some input code that works on everybody's operating system, you would use this. And I just, even though I have like mouse wheel, but I don't have page up and page down. So that's why I'm doing this kind of thing.
I'll fix this in a minute. I'm just going for quick results. If you make a slideshow with 100,000 slides or more, then this will not work correctly. Now, the other thing that's going on here is, you know, I don't know exactly what numbers to assign to these things, but I feel like you don't want to use this kind of auto enum feature that languages often provide because I think you're going to want to serialize these. And so they should have well-defined numbers, but I didn't get to them for these things down here. All right, so let me go to Windows input. don't seem to have the VKs for page up. So let me, let me go to wherever arrow is handled. Oh boy, look at this wonderful routine. Yep, okay. Let me find VK page up. I don't want Java, I just want Uh, define VK left. Just get, okay, here we go. Page up. Oh, it's VK prior and VK next. Of course, how could I forget? VK prior, there we go, and VK next. Okay. Return page up, VK next, return page down. So we're already getting some standard library thing done to do, we'll call this incomplete, convert this to if w param is equal to dot dot dot. I'm not doing that right this second because I'm just compartmentalizing what I'm working or even a lookup table of some kind. Okay, and then, whoops, uh, arrow up. We have the inverse function here, which I'll just do the same thing. If p is equal to page up, return vk prior. If p is equal to page down, return vk next. And the reason we don't use the Windows codes is, you know, because we want to run on other operating systems. And so every operating system needs to have a mapping. All right, well, that appeared to compile. So that's arrow keys. Page up, page down, page up, page down. All right, so let's do this for real though instead of saying slide navigate, it's just like sometimes you can do this, but it's just, you know, it's just bad news. Uh, slide set absolute zero. So I'm, I'm gonna make a, I could just assign this variable here, but you know, we might wanna hook something in to dirty something when you set a slide. Like that's a highly likely thing for us to do. our slideshow called? It's the slideshow. If the slideshow slides say absolute the slideshow dot count minus one. All right, so that's the last hacky way to do it. Oh, not not count. It's dot slides dot count. How many slides do we have? There we go, page up, page down, page up, page down. So we can go to our to-do list and knock the first 
two items off. Hot loading, page up, down. But we also need to commit the compiler. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah, page up, page down, I thought goes to start and end. I don't know. Maybe it shouldn't. I'm pretty sure it does. But all this is going to get... Oh, maybe it's home and end that goes to start and end. Right? Yeah, maybe I'm just... Okay. Sean's probably right about that. But you know what? We should handle home and end. VK home, VK ends. VK... Uh, do I handle them already? No. If W param is equal to VK home, return home. If W param is equal to VK end, return end. Right, and then input uh, home is 134 and is 135. Is there, so Unicode doesn't really talk about keyboard keys, but is there some like international standard for all the keys that you could have on a keyboard and what they are? I don't think so. Like Windows still returns OEM specific keys a lot of the time, but if anybody knows of such a thing that I should be using to define these numbers, then let me know. Uh, okay, so in user input, we're going to change this to home and end. And this one is just going to be. And again, later, this is all going to go into a key remap file. But for now, type mismatch. Oh, geez. That's interesting. So I'm shadowing one end with another end. Um, because in this routine, let me make sure. So, yeah, so I'm using key code. Okay, we're using key current state in the global scope, which also means we don't need to do it there. Um, and then we're using key code and we're shadowing it. So that's why we're not getting a double declaration error because we're doing these usings in two different scopes. So maybe I'm just gonna say key current state dot end because we shadowed that by key code dot end. Same thing. Hmm. Right, it's no surprise. Whoops. Maybe I should think about naming that variable something else. I am. I'm going to prefix that variable so I don't have to do this because, you know, if you just have to do it once, it's no big deal, but um, well, actually, I don't know. I'm up in the air about this. I'm up in the air about this. Which one should change? So the thing is, end is a relatively common word, right? So if you're going to do this thing where you don't prefix your enums, which I like a lot of the time when you have good namespace management, um, you still want to do something
end just feels like a really common thing. But maybe that just means if I'm using key code, I just have to be aware of it. I'm just going to do it this way for now, even though I just said I wasn't going to. Yeah, so there's three more in the file. I'm not sure what the better solution is. All right, so page up, page down. Oh, I got him backwards. Page up goes down and page down goes up. But then home, end, home, end, home, end. All right. Let's swap page up and page down. You could make it so end alone is fine unless there's an ambiguity. Maybe that's not quite the language design you're going for. Well, I mean, the question is, is there overload resolution on things besides procedures, right? If I decided to say, well, everything could be overloaded, which might be a reasonable thing to do, then we would see in that case that one of the declarations of end would have worked as the parameter to that procedure and the other one wouldn't, right? The question is, if you start doing that, what kinds of cans of worms do you open up? Is it bad or is it not bad? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know everything. Sean is linking to, here's an example of fixing the virtual key code mess. Oh yeah, you linked me this a long time ago. I don't remember what it says. But that's more about that's more about actually getting the events correctly from Windows, right? Which is fine. That's totally good. But what I'm what I'm concerned with here is just like, well, what do we what numbers do we put on them? is all I'm thinking about. Am I going to have key binding anyway and not be using any of the key codes directly anyway in favor of command enums? Well, it doesn't matter what I do. What matters is, look, this is going to be in the standard library and people are going to use it. And OK, so even if you do key binding, right, what if you want to save a binary version of your key bindings or something, right? You're going to save out probably the number here. So we want to have the numbers be well-defined and not change them from version to version of the compiler, which if you use automated enum numbers will easily happen if somebody just adds a new key code in the middle. So we want to have them be well-defined. And then if you're well-defining them, it's like, well, then is there a good answer of what they should be? could make a standard MIDI input to make this easier? Make what easier? What? Yeah, so Sean says, I just made up my own set of VK codes that map as many as possible to match ASCII code for US keyboard. I think that's a totally reasonable approach. Um, you know, I definitely did that. So here are the things that map to control characters I've done that with. And then, you know, a to Z and the punctuation are all sort of implicitly defined in this range. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this input file that I'm editing here is in the modules file for the compiler. This is, you know, this is stuff that we're providing to everybody. Uh, you know, they may decide to use their own thing or whatever, but we provide it if people want to use it. All right. Going back to the to-do file, well, uh, let's be able to justify text now. In left, middle, or right, I'm not sure. I guess we also want to be able to change the margins per slide. 
right? So let's let's start doing that. Um, so our slide has a background color. I'm going to say left margin, and um, I'm going to just say minus one means it's unspecified, right? That means we can do something contextual. Maybe maybe we won't like that, but for now. That's going to be it. Left margin, right mar margin, and uh, for slide text, we're going to say justification is uh, center, right? And I'm going to say, I don't know why I'm putting this at the top. It's not that important. It can go down there. I'm not in C++. Uh, left, center, right. Yeah. All right. Make sure we still run. Great. So now, when we draw a slide text, So, if I'm going to call this draw text text item dot justification, draw text. So, We're going to try to have this code be mostly the same, and then we're going to say uh, if, we're going to say sx is a float, uh, if just is equal to, uh, case left, case center, case right, if complete. Case left, uh, sx equals get left margin slide. I'm going to have to pass the slide in. that times back buffer width minus the width of the text and if it's center then we do this one well that's not really right we want to say We want to say the right margin minus the left margin just for readability. Well, there we go. Left is get left margin slide. Right is get right margin slide. Um, center is left plus right times 0.5. That's right in the middle. And then sx is center minus width divided by 2. Okay. And then when we draw the text, we need to pass the current slide. Error, open, oh, cast, not cast left. It's case. What am I thinking? Okay, get left margin. So 
So, I mean, this may be an overly verbose way to do it, or not exactly verbose, but goofy way. But we'll just say, um, slide.left margin return I don't know o dot one fine I mean, I could just make the default 0.1. It's just, I wonder if I'm going to do something about auto-adjusting with respect to aspect ratio. But then maybe in the file, you should be able to say that something is proportional aspect ratio. I don't know. We'll figure that out. Layout issues will come later. Right. Float versus integer. Oh boy, draw text. Didn't match. Oh, I'm calling it. I don't know why, yeah, so. Right now, all this is complaining about the different arguments mismatching on this same routine. It seems very verbose. I maybe only want to do this once and then, and then put these. But that's a thing that we would worry about later. So the problem is, you know, I'm giving it... Let's call this fx for float. fx fx and then sx is cast fx. Maybe I want to add 0.5. I don't know. I don't know. All right, well. Oh, right. So center is not left plus right. It's left plus one minus right. Goofball, oh, that's still not right. Oh, okay, so first of all, so first of all, let me check. Okay, we did set our default justification to center, and when we call draw text, we are calling it with text item justification. So when we're center, okay, get left margin, get right margin. Center equals left plus one minus right times 0.5. So it'll be 0.1 plus 0.9, which should be one, times 0.5, which should be 0.5. Oh, uh, center times back buffer width. Duh, all right. There we go. All right, so that hopefully lets us justify text, but we don't have any way to change the justification. Am I pulling a CPP and pushing multiple strings as a vector? I don't know what you're asking. I don't, decoy octopus X keeps asking me questions that I don't understand. I have a feeling it comes from a different programming culture. Uh, okay. Um, or maybe I'm just not paying enough attention to chat. That's always possible. Can't I change the default to left or right justification to check fast? Yes, I could, but I'm just going to finish the feature and then we'll check to our heart's content. Um, so, I'm going to go into, um, what is it called? What's our file that reads? The, it's just in slides, right? Yeah, this is our thing. You know what? I feel like I don't really need this anymore. 
That was just sample code from the other thing. Um, so if we get, I'm going to say justify. I'm going to say, I'm going to say uh, uh, kind and uh, rest is break by spaces uh, RHS. If rest, then we have junk on the end of line. Junk at end of line, whatever, whatever. Let's continue. Otherwise, um, what is the kind? I'm going to say just is equal using justification. Just is center. Uh, if kind is equal to case uh, left, case center, case right. Now, this is a case sensitive comparison, which may not be exactly what we want. Maybe I should lower. Or, canonically lowercase it later, but you know, in the long, long term, people probably won't be editing these files by hand, so whatever. Um, uh, default, if it's none of these, then we say error at line whatever, unknown justification whatever, uh, valid options are left, Center right. And then and then, you know, I'm gonna wanna I'm gonna wanna refactor this error. Like this whole like, hey, I got something for a slide, but there's no slide yet. Like, that's going to happen on every single one of these. So I think, right, whoops, I think we're going to want to factor that out. Got a justification. So if current slide, current text state just justification equals just that, it will hopefully be it. Oh, we don't do default. OK, so first of all, we got to do these. And this is just the case. All right. So we didn't break anything horribly. So uh, my dot show uh, justify left. Hey, justify right. Hey, justify center. Hey, justify ba 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 ba, and we get an error. Unknown justification, ba 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 ba. I missed a parenthesis there. I was going to say it got it perfect the first time, but I missed a parenthesis. Hope somebody caught that in chat. But that's pretty promising, right? And then let me do it. Let me do it midline. Justify right. Justify left. And we go to the next slide and it's reset, of course. So, I mean, I can't complain about that. Right? 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 
Sean says, earlier I was trying to say, I was thinking maybe it's a quick and dirty hack for flowing around images. You just temporarily adjust the margins to avoid the image, even though it's not at all correct. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's a reason to have that minus one for the default margins, right? Because then I can check, like, okay, if you specifically said you want a certain margin, then we don't do that. But if it's minus one and we're around the image, then we do do that. Uh, the only other thing is that, you know, very often I like to make a big image and make it be the background. So we probably want a way to tag images as being background or not. Um, but yeah, something like that might work. How does the program handle windowing system, WinAPI or XORG? Well, that's already supposedly handled by our standard library. So again, the standard library here will provide you things that are more than what C++ style standard libraries provide you. Well, also less. We're not gonna give you the equivalent of like include algorithm or whatever, right? We're not gonna do that stuff. Uh, we're not gonna be like boost either, but we're gonna have like open a window and play sounds. We're gonna have stuff like that, that you actually wanna do uh, as the standard library. Um, because why wouldn't you do that in the year 2017? What about the word wrap that left justifies off the initial justification? Maybe, I mean, you know, like I'm saying, word wrap kind of stuff comes later. We could do that if we want. Um, I'm just trying not, you know, as always, I'm trying not to assume too much about what I'm building. Because if I just try to clone PowerPoint, or if all the ideas for what I'm trying to do come from PowerPoint, then I end up with PowerPoint, and I don't want PowerPoint. Right? Like, I want to not do that. Oh, we got to be able to change the font and the font size. Yes. Now, here's the thing also. Um, let's start with font size because that's easier, and then we'll do font. Whoop. And uh, the thing is, how am I going to specify the font size? You don't want to specify it in screen pixels. Um, you don't want, I don't think that points make sense. Like when you say whatever point font, I mean, I guess that means something for typesetters. Like it means a specific size on a printed page, but for a presentation, I don't know how big it is or whatever. Um, so here's what I think. Um, I feel like the font size is gonna be a floating point number where 100 means 100% 100 of the screen height, right? So 10 means you could tile the text 10 times, 10 lines would fit on the screen, right? And eight would mean 12 and a half lines would fit on the screen or whatever, um, and so forth. Like I, I kind of can guess what that means. Whereas none, none of the other measurements mean anything to me. If anyone else has a suggestion that's not that, let me know. Um, and while you guys are letting me know that, I'm going to start making allowances for font size. Uh, so we're going to go back here. And here I'm going to say font size equals, I don't know, um, o dot o eight. That's just a guess. And then um, when we draw text, uh, it's in draw. Okay, so integer size is uh, cast to int uh, 100 times, no. Um, text item dot font size times 0 0.01 because 1.0 right this is a little bit chauvinistic for horizontally laid out text but most most languages in the world are horizontal um, and if we ever want to do good handling of vertical we can special case it so 
times back buffer height, right? And then integer size. So we can't specify it yet. Whoops. Okay, that's very small. If you see there, it's very, very small. What did I do wrong? What did, it, what, what did I make my default font size? Why did I say, I said 100. Because I don't write, because I do want to make this a little bit human to use. So like eight, eight is the font size, not 0.08. All right, that seems kind of reasonable. My, my default font size should probably be bigger, like 10. Because you don't want you don't want to encourage people to make really long sentences. How am I planning to handle 16 by 9 versus 5 dot by 4? I don't know. We're going to figure that out as we go along. Steve Jobs once made a huge deal of having rounded corners. Of rounded corners of what? What's my thought on using NAN for initting floats to illegal values? Um, I don't know about NAN, but in my new code, because we have constants for infinity and minus infinity, I often set things to, so if you want to like find the largest value in an array, I'll often initialize it to minus infinity because comparing against that is well-defined. So I do that, I don't know about NAN, NAN creeps me out. Um, so, so Manquia is saying the 0 to 100 seems sound, but the major problem comes from stretching. This has nothing to do with stretching, really. Like, um, it's just a unit scale, so it won't, it won't cause stretching. And like, like, if I accidentally stretch things, it'll be because something else happened. It won't be that. Okay, uh, so now let's let us change the font size. And I'm just going to let that be called uh, size. And after this, I'm going to put on my to-do uh, refactor the no slide yet error message. But I'm going to do that after I change the font size. So case size. String to float, RHS, if success, <sighs> handler.line number, continue. This is colon equals, and then um, oops, if current slide, current text, uh, current text state dot text size, I guess. Is it called text size? Uh, font size equals uh, f. If f is less than or equal to zero, invalid font size whatever. versus float. What? Okay, that has to be a float. We established that. Isn't it good? So that's a place where that would have just been a bug in C++. I mean, not that C++ lets you auto things that easily, but if you said auto whatever equals 10, pretty sure it would infer it to int and it would silently cat. I don't know. I don't know, man. All right. So let's go to my dot show and see if this works. Size five. 
Oh yeah, 50. Oh yeah. Oh, that's a little big, isn't it? 30. See, it's so great. You don't need a WYSIWYG, you just type things. 10, 11, 12, 10. So that's pretty good. All right, but now I'm gonna do that refactor that I was saying. Uh, which was, well, let's change this size to, to something that'll remind us that we can change font sizes. Okay, so we did that, and we're going to refactor the no slide yet error message, because like I said, that's going to happen all the time. So instead, I'm going to say, um, uh, I'm just going to make a super generic error message, because it's probably not, not going to happen often anyway. Uh, I'm going to say I'm going to say uh, is current slide a local if So, check current slide, a uh, slide is a slide in handler, text file handler. If no slide, then Got a slide or text property, but we haven't started any slide yet. Right, and we go to bool, but we, okay, so if any check current slide, current slide, uh, handler, continue. Right, and then here as well. And then here as well. And there. Okay, that's good enough. Hopefully I didn't break anything. Pointer versus non-pointer. That's fine. All right. Well, it appears to all work. Well. If you want font size 10 to fit 10 lines of code, maybe you want to map not the font size or the target size, but map line vertical advance to that. Yeah, I mean, I'm up in the air about whether I want it to mean literally fit 10 lines or whether I want it to mean the physical letters themselves tend to be about that high. It's not obvious to me right now which one makes more sense. Um, so, I mean, maybe let's just see how it goes. This is starting to look like deck set for Mac. That app takes markdown formatted files and outputs template slides. No WYSIWYG editor. Yeah. Um, all right, well, so the question of exactly what that size means is easily adjustable. So we can do that at any time when we figure out 
what we are doing, but let's make it so you can change a font. And um, I think I think that just like um, let me go let's go to the my show right now. I guess we don't really anyway, so I think we want to separate the file name of the font from the name that we use to refer to it everywhere, right? Because uh, you know, we might want to change the file name to experiment around and not have to change every place that we use that font, right? So I think um, I think we want to do something like, I don't know, declare font uh, uh, main font to be, let's pick a file name. Let's let's start also with um, we'll use Carmina bold italic declare font Carmina right um, so we have short names and you know, we can use those names to refer to font asset files, right? Now, interestingly, um, I already have a space in a file name here, and the question is gonna be how do we deal with that? And how we're gonna deal with that initially is we're just gonna use everything from here to the end of the line. That'll fill out naturally with the way the parser works. Um, anyway, once we do that, then, we will be able to do something like font uh, fixed, right? And uh, what was the other one? Font sans. So right now we should be able to run this and it just will complain. Yeah. So it's complaining about these commands that we haven't implemented yet, um, which is fine. Okay, yeah, so I totally don't want to get in the business of OS fonts because that's one of the things that causes your program to break from place to place. Um, you know, it's just like video codecs. Like video codecs installed on your system are the worst idea because that's, the way that is handled is what makes video so flaky and broken on PCs, right? If you just treated it as a, like a video file is just a freaking file format. Right? And if you just read the video file from your, you know, whatever. It's, it's an analogous situation where if you start relying on system installed fonts to do things, those are going to magically change a little bit behind your back and you wouldn't, won't know what's happening and whatnot and it'll be bad news. So uh, I prefer not to do that and to instead just package a known set of fonts with the application. and then let, let the users add their own uh, as well, right? But if you start using your own font, it'll get copied into the presentation and then go with it, right? So if you run that presentation on another machine, then it'll be able to use that font regardless. Like it could even be a, a operating system that doesn't license any fonts much, like Linux or something, and you'll still get the font that you want. Okay. 
So let's implement these commands. Let's say declare font. Okay, so I'm going to say uh, font font dictionary is a table. I need to look at this. It's a table that goes from string to uh, a pointer to, no, it goes from string to string, right? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, so, so we don't have a font catalog yet. So this can map from the short name to the file name. And so let me be very explicit about that. Font short name to file to asset, asset name. That way there's no confusion about what that's mapping, right? And then um, what else? Font asset name name to pointer is a table going from string to pointer to dynamic font. And actually, you know what? We're just we're just going to make a font catalog, probably. Yeah. Uh, We'll do it this way just as a sanity check. We don't want to, oh. Right now, this expression doesn't, this parses as an expression that's a non-type expression, so I have to do this. All right. Like, it thinks I'm trying to take the address of some variable called dynamic font and pass that um, when that's not what I'm trying to do. All right. Let's make sure we don't crash. Great. So uh, declare font is simply going to do the following. Declare font. If um, and then we're going to take the name, so short name and uh, asset name is going to be break by spaces of RHS and is that, yeah. I should make a wrapper that just says error at line whatever. Let's put that on the to do, right? It's good to do these things before you have too many instances. Uh, routine for error at line whatever message. All right. If we didn't get an asset name, um, did not find a valid asset name or the font uh, or file name. Let's call it file name because nobody's going to know what an asset name is. Um, Handler.line number, right? And if short name did not find a valid short Okay. Otherwise, we have asset name and short name, and I'll say, well, uh, if find font short name to asset well, table is going to be the slideshow dot font short. Wait, is this the slideshow yet? No, it's result. I keep almost doing that. 
table is going to be, we're just going to have a name for that. So if find in table, is that the right way to do it? I called it table find for some reason, because I don't totally trust overloading yet. Um, if we find in the table a short name, then agent error at line whatever uh, redeclaration of font name whatever short name continue otherwise uh, table add table copy string short name copy string set name right Something like that. Success is being ignored, which is disallowed. Really? Really? Why did I do that? Oh, because, okay. Right. See, here I was assuming that it returns a Boolean is the first thing, but it actually returns a value. So, uh, dummy success is that if not success. So maybe, maybe we really want the success value to be the first return value of table find. That might be the better way, oh wait, that might be the better way to make the API. Log print. What? Line 231, format string requires two arguments. Oh, hey, my linter caught something. Good thing I did that the other day. Requires two arguments, but one argument is given. I hope somebody on the stream saw that. Of course, we're going to get rid of the need for that soon. All right, so now, so we still um, will not be able to change the actual font yet, but it'll at least hopefully not complain about that command and it hopefully won't crash. Yeah. Um, oh, but we haven't started any slide yet. That's bad, but we hope somebody caught that. Um, okay. In line seven. Okay, so declare font shouldn't have this, right? Declare font doesn't care about what slide we're on. All right, so now it's just complaining about the font command, right? It's fine. Oh wait, redeclaration of font name, right? Because I said if not success. I really want this to say dummy comma found, and if found, then that, right? So now, what really? Did that recompile? What? Found. Wait, do I have a global called found? What is, ah, oh, earlier. Oh, the, the horror of shadowing variables. All right, so that's pretty good. Uh, actually, let's test that. So if I say, Declare font sans to be under tail font.otf. Okay, redeclaration of font name sans. So that is good. And now we don't have a redeclaration of font name sans. Uh, although the logger does deduplication. So, uh, yeah, long story. I need to think about that. Anyway. Anyway, so we're doing good. We need to declare this font command. Too busy talking about the clouds, the ocean, and bitcoins. Well, I'm glad I'm sitting here programming while you guys talk about bitcoins. All right, um, maybe I should talk about bitcoins instead of making a slideshow. Okay, so to change the font,
You know what, we passed the string font name here already. So uh, I'm not even gonna use that pointer member for now because we don't need it. And by the time this becomes a speed problem, we may have redesigned this anyway. So I'm just gonna do this and I'm gonna say um, asset name is uh, the slideshow dot found table find the slideshow dot font short short name to asset name and okay. How do I, what do I want to do if they haven't set a font? That's a good question. So, here I'm going to say, I'm going to say, we have some other issues to deal with too, but let me, let me deal with this. So, if text item dot font name I'm just going to do this so that's what we'll get uh, if and then if found else Log print draw um, unable to find an asset name a font name. Uh, so we're in do we have a slide index? Yeah, we'll just say error drawing slide whatever font name whatever. Current slide index and text item dot font name. All right, and then font name. So now we've got a couple of issues. One is that the font name is dynamically allocated, and so When we do this make text, we've got to copy it. Right, so um, we've got to say, uh, da, 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 well, we'll just say result dot uh, font name is copy string state dot font name. It's fine if it's the empty string, it'll just return us the empty string. And then, okay, we never set that for some reason. Oh, we never did our font command, right? Declare font, font. So if we look up, in, or if we try to set an invalid font, I'm not actually, um, I'm not actually, I think we're going to want to declare a default font. So I'm making this font thing be a property that resets every slide, which I think is the right thing to do. Uh, but anyway, all right, let's write the command. Well, let's check it here also. I, the error when drawing is probably redundant because we're going to check it here. Table find uh, result dot font short name to asset name and um, 
if not found, error at, whoops, error at line whatever, attempt to use invalid font name whatever asset name, right? Otherwise, uh, free, what is it called, text properties? Current text state. And then current text state that font name is copy string asset name. And then the other thing is when we reset current text state, or we reset to default. State dot font name. Because let's let's not leak if we don't have to. It's not called font name. What? Oh, because we haven't put it there. I forgot to put the argument to table find. Procedure call did not match. I uh, did it the same thing in slides in 241. Let's see what happens. I'm not finding asset names. Okay, but that's what? Where is that? That's in draw. Why am I storing the f what? Well, actually, yeah. So we're going to store the short names. We could store the asset names, and that'll be faster. But really, if we're going to cache something, we probably cache the pointer of the font. Hey, look. OK, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to go to the slideshow. The thing about fonts is they have very different ideas from each other about what sizes mean. Okay, there we go. We can change fonts. So on Hello Sailor, I can say font uh, sans. I can say font fixed. Or I can say font blah, 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 and it'll just complain, right? Carmina. Oh, did it die? It didn't like it when I gave it a... Good that we're testing that. Yeah, so why? Where are we crashing? Um, either, well, there's only a couple places. Well, let's just run it. Devin, run tree. Someday I will print out a stack trace when you crash. But I don't yet do that. All right. Access violation reading some location. We're in log print. Oh, okay. Because if we didn't 
be found, we probably have a garbage asset name, right? Um, it probably returns an uninitialized because it's the wrong thing there. Right. So there we go. Attempt to use invalid font name. Gaga, gaga, gaga. I feel like we need at least one other good font in there. Um, Because we have like two fixed widths. Um, I don't remember. None of these are really particularly nice. Like Lava Pro, let's let's bring that one in. And where do we want to put that? Let's put that only on the bottom one of radio. All right. So this is quality, man. I can work with this is what I'm saying. This is quality. So that may be the last big feature I'm going to do Tonight, maybe? I don't know. What do you think? Should I keep going? I was going to do something else tonight, but I kind of, now that I think about it, don't really have anything to do. So, the one thing I do want to do, though, is um, I want to hit this one so I don't keep doing those very repetitive error messages all the time. Comic Sans would be quality, that's true. What was a terrible pronunciation of what font name? Gaga ga 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 ga. I don't know what's going on. There's always dinner grounds, except they ruined the servers with that latest patch, right? And there's tons of so-called server lag, which is really the servers crashing and or getting stuck in infinite loops or something. I don't know, is it better if they straighten that stuff out? Okay. Um, so... Right, I was going to do this. I was going to say, I'm going to make a routine called error, where we say handler, comma, um, unable to read y coordinate, right? So error, uh, handler is a text file handler, and String, uh, format is a string, and then args is a whatever any, right? And we're just going to say blog print uh, handler.log agent. Uh, okay, format string full format is concatenate format. I don't have a version of concatenate that, that uses temporary storage, I think. Let me see. Yeah, I can't pass an allocator to there. Um, I'm just going to... Normally, I might add an extra argument here or something else, but I actually have a weird master plan about a better way to do this. Um, so, 
And plus, I don't have a way to do arguments after varargs as yet. Actually, that's sort of the main thing. Uh, so let's just say um, we're going to concatenate format comma whatever uh, error in line percentage colon space and format. I'm just going to defer free for. I could make a temporary storage by pushing a new allocator. I just don't want to bother right now because I don't care. Um, and then we're going to log print handler.logagent full format. Oh. I don't think I can do this following thing. Right, because I want to add an argument to the verargs. Interesting. Can I not do that right now? Attempt to spread into varargs, but previous argument already started occupying the vararg slot. All right, so this is a thing. Language feature, let me somehow concatenate arrays easily. I don't know. Um, we'll use temporary storage for this one. Um, new args is Do I have an array? I have an array copy, but not with an offset of one. I'm totally I'm totally like obsessing over ways to do this thing that's really easy because I want to, I kind of want to magically do it in the nice way and no, I'm going to have to fall back to what you would do in C or whatever. So I'm just going to do this. Um, do I have, yeah, temporary alloc. So new args.data is temporary, temporary alloc args.count plus one times size of any new args.data sub or just to say new args sub zero equals uh, uh, handler.line number four zero to args.count minus one new args one plus it one plus it equals uh, so I'm just you know I'm making an array and it uh, yeah whatever whatever man and then we just say new args. And we're using temporary storage for this. And it's all for an error message, so it doesn't matter all that much anyway. Uh, okay, given text file handler. I think we can just do that. Yeah. All right, so let's test that error message by, oh, let's fix our invalid font name too. But we called error on uh, unable to read Y coordinate. So first let me let me do right. so that's back. Now when we say y whatever, that should give us an unable to read y coordinate error in line 24. 
So that's great. So now we convert all our error messages to that. So log print. Instead, we just say error handler junk at end of line. And we don't say the line number. We just say that. Error. Handler, unknown justification, whatever kind. Error. Handler. Floating point number for the size. Error. Handler. Invalid font size. Of course, we didn't make static checking for our error. And, oh, but we do, we can, actually we can, right? Because we just tag it print like. Isn't that what we do? Uh, what? Yeah, okay. Let's make sure that this works. This will be great if that works. Okay, so we didn't get any errors so far, but um, unable to read y coordinate, whatever. I put a percent and I didn't pass an argument, and it caught it. Oh, meta programming is so good, man. So, all I had to do, so for people who weren't here for the previous stream, all I had to do was tag this routine as print like, and that kicks in this thing. Uh, well, I made I made a, a checks module that you can use, and it does some additional error checking. And one of those things is it checks anything that's called a print like it validates it, right? And so, um, you know, is print like just means does it have this note on it that says print like? And to validate it, we look and we make sure that it has a format string. Well, we make sure it's a procedure. We make sure it has enough arguments. Uh, we make sure it's got a, a format string, and we look for parentheses in the format string, and you know we count the number of parentheses and so on. So that's great. I just realized actually, um, incomplete count percents does not handle stuff like percent one, percent two, etc. We only count the number of percents, but we don't check to see if these numbers are out of range. So we can do that later. But that's great. So all we had to do is tag this. And even though it constructs a new array and passes it on, the number of percents in the format string that goes with error is supposed to match the number in the arguments. So that I'm very happy with that. All right, let me continue replacing these. This is grunt work, but hey, it makes the code better. I'm going to go log print agent, comma, error, and actually, I'm going to replace this whole string with, well, this whole string with error handler, comma, and oh, there was only three. It took me about the same amount of effort. Because sometimes I say error handler dot log agent. Maybe this is all of them. Yeah. Well, whatever, man. Okay. Error handler.
Well, see, sometimes the reason I like to crank through fun features and leave housekeeping to a little later is sometimes it takes more work than you would have liked, and then in the end, you have exactly what you had. I have exactly what I had, but with shorter error messages. Um, I'm going to take a five minute break. And then we'll come back and do some more stuff. I'm going to make some tea, and we can do a little bit of Q&A. So think about what cues you want me to A, and I'll be back in a few minutes. For what it's worth, link to if you pushed a hot fix to the servers, it should fix the issue seen. So they posted that at 4 a.m., but I was watching a live streamer play, um, I want to say during lunch today, and they had a game ruined when it did server lag detected and never came back from it. So that, that was maybe a straight up server crash.
what extent I think I should integrate language into this. The eventual goal to allow the user to hook into everything. Maybe, sure, I don't know. I mean, you're asking about long-term goals and right now I don't even want to do anything too fancy yet. I just want to be able to have reasonable presentations. Eventually I'd like to be able to control stuff programmatically, but I haven't thought too much about how that will work. How do I like that razor blade? Um, it's the best laptop that I know of for what I do, but it has a lot of problems. But everybody else's laptops are worse. So it's the best that I know how to get at the moment. If somebody would sell a $8,000 laptop that wasn't a piece of crap, then I would buy it. But nobody sells that. so. Um, you know, this, nobody makes laptops that are like professional tools for professional programmers, you know? Um, like, if you work in an auto shop or something, there's like tool vendors that sell you like serious tools that are way more uh, robust and... Um, just professional than the tools that regular people buy at Ace Hardware or something, right? But that doesn't exist for laptops. I don't know why. Nobody has done it. Probably not a big enough market or something. Am I going to release a slideshow software once it's done? Probably. I mean, it'll probably just be released along with the initial release of the compiler. Uh, as an example program, so you'd have full source code to it and stuff. All right. Someone's saying laptops are the wrong tool for the job, but I like to program in coffee shops, man. And it's not like desktops are any better. Like my laptop is better in some ways than my desktop machine, which is pretty sad. The annotations in the comments are just plain text. They're not, they're not being formally processed in any way. The equivalent computers are talking about would be like NASA computers or something, at least as far as things that exist. No, I mean, I mean, you know, like, I don't know. I don't know, man. All right, I'm getting relatively off-topic questions, which I could answer, but they're not about slideshows. So the five-minute break that was really 12 minutes or whatever is over. Let's do one or two more things. Um, let's do, because we were doing uh, all this font or text property stuff, let's make uh, the style thing. And then, what else? I feel like images is maybe a good thing to start next time with. So I'm not going to do that yet. Like most of these things are pretty different from what has been going on tonight. So. So. Yeah, maybe just these top two, right? Okay, what do I want to do? I want to basically say define style but I'm not going to cram it all in one line like I was when I was thinking before because this could get arbitrarily long or whatever. We're going to say define style 
Oh, you know what? Okay, wait, before we do that. No, this will be fine. Not before we do that. So we're going to have a define style command. It's going to have some style. And we're just going to use the same color and whatever properties as we did before. So we're going to say, well, we're going to define a style. It's going to um, say it's going to have a size. It's going to have a font. It's going to have a text color. And I guess we could even set a Y, right? Let's make it hide just so that we know it's working. Um, and uh, justification. Wait, is justification that's on? No, that's on the slide text. Okay, so. I'm going to have a weird syntax for now just because it's going to make it easier to program. I'm going to put this at the end. And at the beginning, I'm going to say um, begin style or something, right? So this is going to say reset your style state to default, start filling in all this stuff, and then define a new style. Now, interestingly, that error checking that we just did, because we, we have all this error checking of like, oh, make sure we are in a slide currently. But we don't need that for any of these. We just want to make sure that we're in a style or something. Anyway, if that all makes sense. All right, so then the point is going to be, once that style sticks around, then if we say, you know, um, when I comment this stuff out, I should be able to say, um, let's make this really obvious. Let's make it like fully read text. I want to be able to say style my style and then, and then I'll override the size. You know, so that'll just be, this just basically means copy all these properties into the current text thing and then, and then, oh, we're going to override one, right? So if we run this now, it'll complain it doesn't know what those mean, right? Doesn't know begin style and then we haven't started any slide yet. Okay. Let's see, current text state. Actually, I'll change the format because it's, let's do this, begin style and the name, and then end style, right? I'm going to say defining style name is a string. That's going to be the empty string.
and I'm going to say, well, if we begin style, then uh, if defining style name error handler already defining a style and whatever comma uh, defining style name continue else well, no. Um, and style defining style name. Uh, free string defining style name. No. Let's do that. Um, begin style. Defining style name is copy string um, IHS. Okay. Case end style. If RHS error handler junk. Um, okay. We find style results, uh, current text. Defining style name. Okay. This is all good. Well, instead of end style, now I've said this result current text state defining style name. Okay. This is fine. Now, define style is going to be a show as a pointer to a slideshow. Uh, state is slide text, and name is a string. And we're going to say uh, well, first we're going to check for a duplicate if. Oh, handler, if, now we're going to say old value success is table find, table, comma, um, name, if found, let's not call it success because it's actually failure, found, error, uh, handler, to redeclare style, whatever. Game. Return. Right. And table in all this, by the way, is going to be something called show dot style table. All right. So table add table name uh, state copy. State copy is new slide x. State copy equals state. Oh, oh my, we can't do that. Um, we gotta copy this. Copy that command. Um, because, you know. Yeah. 
Well, let's do this. Source. I don't do the mem copy thing of putting dest first because why would I? So dest equals source, but uh, da, da, da. Uh, dest text is copy source text dest name. Okay, we have to, when we say define style, we have to pass the handler. And I don't know where we're at now. Pointer versus non-pointer, yes. So this is a, a good way to make sure you don't confuse those. Okay, we have to make the style table. Forgot about that. Style table is a table from string to pointer to uh, slide text. All right. So maybe if all that works, we still can't use styles but we should be able to define them maybe. I have a feeling it's not gonna totally work because it was too complicated. Oh, right, well there's the error message thing. Did I hose my background color somehow? What did I do there? Oh, I commented that out because I was commenting out text properties. I like my red background. Okay, so here's the thing. We're erroring on these guys uh, because, you know, we have a text property. So we need an additional condition. So check. This whole check current slide thing needs uh, defining style name. Okay, can I? I'm gonna call this a different thing. I'm gonna call this check text property. There's slide properties and we're gonna call it check slide property and check text property. Current slide and uh, we'll pass defining style name. So if we're defining a style, then it's okay. And if we have a current slide, then it's okay. So check text property, check text property. Uh, oh, when we say font, Check text property. And there's other errors that I can check for, like if I screw up and start defining a slide in the middle of a style, that's going to have weird behavior. But let's make it work first. Uh, error message if I start a slide. Okay, check slide property and check text property. Um, text defining style in the string. Okay. Attempt to use invalid font name Carmina. I thought I defined that, but then also command style. So define styles 
are apparently being processed. Like I said, we're not doing anything with them yet. So, oh, because, okay, I'm declaring the styles before the fonts. Yes, we have order of declaration issues here, but I don't care. All right. So, now we just have to use the styles. Use the styles. So, begin style, end style. Or, use of a style is going to be the following. Um, well, Style is um, table find result dot uh, style table and uh, RHS. If oh, style found, if not found, error handler attempt to use undefined style whatever. Comma, all right, just continue. Otherwise, we will say reset to defaults. Okay, reset to defaults um, current text state, the strings, uh, copy uh, style text state. I give the data. All right. I know, man. Attempt to use undefined style, my style. Okay, why? End style. Didn't say junk on end of line. Table add print. Adding a style. Adding a style, my style. Well, what's your problem, guys? Style my style. Wait, we didn't get that error this time. Oh, now it worked. I must have not recompiled correctly or something. Anyway, right, so, so this is working exactly, right? So we set my style to be right justified, Carmina, right? So we define my style up here and then we use it down here and we override the size. So I can change the size here and override it. Um, I don't know why that's not right justified. Wait, wait, what happened? It sometimes says attempt to use undefined style, my style, and other times doesn't. What is going on there? I have a weird bug. I literally just am changing white space and it's using it or not. Which is, I realize, approximately Microsoft PowerPoint quality, but we're aiming for more than that. So we're going to have to fix this. I wonder if my hash table is buggy. Or something else. Attempt to use undefined style, my style. I don't know. Well, it works sometimes. 
Let's just go up here and change the style, make sure all this stuff works. It's so weird. All right. Um, justify left. Y point one. So it works aside from this one bug, which I'm frankly not totally sure what the bug is. Normally I would think, well, I'm manipulating temporary strings and then not correctly copying it or something. But But the scope of this error print is after that. Oh, I know what it is. So I have to copy the name here when I add to the table. Because otherwise, you know, it's something that gets thrown away when we stop processing the file. So. Uh, size 12, size 11, 10, text color. Look, it's working 100% of the time now. All right, so that is, that is good. error message if I start a slide without M style that should be easy so we're going to say slide if defining style name error handler style
current text state and defining style name. <sighs> this is sort of a place where I would use a macro or something, but we won't do it. So Slide snow, that's a good name for it. Slide snow. Uh, all right, is it text item? Slide, uh, slide text. Slide text. Uh, show. So all that was just for me to put an error message to catch when I do the following. All right, Aaron line 15, attempt to start a new slide while defining a style, missing end style. Okay, but I'm not catching multiple redundant end styles. end style without a matching begin style because we had one up here because of our my name is mud so we'll save that out there's no more my name is mud and we have styles I feel like that's what I want to do today I feel like we maybe start next time with auto layout because that'll be a nice thing to do fresh then we can do some rectangles, and then who knows from there. Images, probably. Let's sort this in order of what we're going to do next time. Uh, images. And then I don't know after that. Are there any questions about what we did today? Question. If I make minor changes to the, yeah. Is it time to change the window title? Yeah, of course. Why am I still calling it Sokoban? Is it, does it still say Sokoban? Yes. Why does it say Sokoban? That's ridiculous. either slide snow or slide how or slide snow. Okay. What did we do today? Go back and watch the video. Do I make that copy string error a lot? Is there a way to detect it? Um, I wouldn't say I make it a lot. I make it a little bit. Um, typically, the way that you detect it, uh, well, there's two ways. Like one is with some kind of static analysis, which I'm not a super big fan of for various reasons I won't get into. Um, the more obvious way is just when you free memory like that, like when you release the file that you got the string out of, then you just splat an obvious pattern over it, you know, like the in Windows C++ in the debug heap when you free something, 
it writes CD, 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 CD in there. I think because OXCD is an interrupt instruction, or CC actually, CC is an interrupt instruction on X64, and when you clear the stack, it goes CC, and I think they said CD for the heap, just because it's like CC, but a different number, so you can tell what memory you're looking at or something. I don't know. I don't know why they pick CD, but they do. So you do something like that, and then when you see that, so first of all, it would print out a garbage string instead of saying a string that, well, you know, it wouldn't have printed one in the error message because we were printing the new string that we were looking up in the error message. But what would happen is, if you're debugging, you would look in the hash table and you would look at the strings and you would see that the memory is CD, 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 and so on, right? Um, you could even go further than that. Like, I want to do some kind of runtime instrumentation where you declare, you know, so uh, systems like Purify, for example, which is a, a memory debugging tool, among other things, um, you know, you have this trick where every time you allocate memory, you never you never use it again, right? And then when you free it, it just goes on to some list of invalid things. And then you just check all your pointers to see if they point into that space, right? And we have the capability to do that kind of a thing. So um, that costs more at uh, in terms of runtime cost, but maybe you only turn it on once in a while when you want to debug a, a memory bug. So having that kind of thing built in, I think, will be good. And I don't have those facilities right now. Do I use any SVN control features beyond simple commit checkout? Well, I use looking at the log of what happened when and diffing. Not too often, but I use those things. That's about it. Can I provide syntax rules of the language? It's not final, and I don't care about syntax very much yet because syntax is relatively easy compared to the harder issues of language design, which are what I'm working on. Yeah, so, so real major lag says OXCD is intermediate. So I guess the second CD would be the immediate or something, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but whatever. I mean, the goal is just to be a pattern that breaks things when you see it or when you hit it. And it does that very well. Is there a way to print the file and line number when you get a seg fault at runtime without having to run the program in Visual Studio? Yeah, um, it's in principle doable. Certainly printing out the call stack is doable and then you would know in which procedure you failed. Um, and then it's, it's quite possible to then uh, cross-reference the instruction pointer back to the line number and it's just, that's work that we haven't done yet. Do I know any good books or video tutorials on C++ games programming? No. Yeah, there's no, I, I can't name any good programming books, period, much less game programming books. Um, part of that may be because I'm not looking, because I'm not looking for books on how to program because I've found a way that I like to program that I'm comfortable programming. Um, but it's just to say that I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What happens if the security on the computer which is used for presentation doesn't allow running unsigned EXEs? Then those people can jump off a cliff for all I care. Um, I mean, that this program, you know, the eventual plan is that you're going to be running executable stuff in it, right? And so, you know, this is for programmers and technical people, and for my own use, I'm expecting that I'll be running off my own laptop anyway, because that's really the only way to make sure that a presentation goes well. You can't, like, bring a PowerPoint file to somebody else's laptop and hope it displays correctly, because it's not going to half the time. So, um, you know, if people are serious about a presentation going well, then they let you plug in your own laptop in the first place.
I mean, the whole not running unsigned EXEs is so misguided anyway, because the NSA can pwn you just by plugging something into the USB port, or they can probably pwn you over an air gap at this point, right? They can probably like locate one of the antennas in your computer and then send it something that causes a buffer overflow and like pwn you without you ever even knowing what's going on. So if you've got a public computer like that, where public means anyone has access to it to do something, then if you want it to be secure, you have to at minimum just reformat it all the time. But in reality, it's not secure. Like as soon as anybody uses it, it's not secure. As soon as anybody puts a file onto the machine, it's not secure because that's where we are today. So like not running unsigned EXEs is so much the least of your problems that uh, or it's a feeble solution, let me say, because it doesn't solve anything. <laughs> yeah, the CPU has firmware that's not secure, right? Um, you know, or it can get row hammered. I mean, I guess that's something a signed executable would try to get around. I don't know. I don't know. I just spilled tea on myself, which means it's probably time to end. That's how that goes. That's the signal. So thanks everybody for showing up and uh, it's been a good time. We got lots of functionality in on the slide program. I'm not sure when the next stream is gonna be. It won't be too long from now. Uh, it may not be tomorrow though, we'll see. Thank you for coming by, see you later.